Welcome to Executive Leaders Radio, your spot in the corner office, the radio show where executives share their secrets to success. Executive Leaders Radio. You're listening to Executive Leaders Radio. This is your host, Herb Cohen, with my co-host, Shannon Lane, Newmark Knight Frank, Drew Hanlon Hanlon, Pat Riley, USI, Frank Hennessy, Premier Planning, Ben Drummond, D2 Integrated Solutions, Matthew Shapiro, Urban Meyer, and Jim Bell, Able HR. Matthew, can you give us a rundown on who we have on the air today, please? Sure can, Herb. I'm really looking forward to this morning's show. We're starting off with Andy Turner, the CEO of Lone Star Technologies. Then we have Ann Rice Burgess, President and CEO of Methodist Services. Following that, we have Tim Bennett, the owner of Bennett Compost. And we're wrapping up today with Rob Craven, Jr., the president of F.A. Davis Company. Let's get to know Andy Turner, CEO of Lone Star Technologies. Andy, what is Lone Star Technologies? What are you guys doing? Lone Star is a point of sale technology that allows consumers to finance uh, goods and services through local banks and credit unions. Predominantly home improvement contractors use it uh, to present you know, roofing, door and window, that sort of cool. stuff. And uh, how'd you get a job with this company? Uh, I co-founded Lone Star in 2015. And uh, where are you from originally? How many brothers and sisters? Where are you in the pecking order? I'm from Northeast Philadelphia and the oldest of two boys. Uh-huh. And Northeast Philadelphia is like row houses. It wasn't uh, the fancy danciest of all neighborhoods, was it? No, not at all. It's a little hard scrabble uh, where I was from. Mm-hmm. And what were you doing 8 to 14 years old? What kind of stuff were you up to? Uh, a lot of sports, uh, a lot of hanging out on the corner, uh, you know, that city kid stuff. Drew. And you mentioned going from Northeast Philly to, Philly to a pretty prestigious high school with Sal. What was that experience like? Uh, that was a real game changer for me, Drew. Um, we, we, uh, I was the only kid from my uh, elementary school that went to LaSalle, fortunate enough to get a scholarship to go there, which was how we were able to afford it. And um, a very different uh, mentality with kids that traditionally go to LaSalle than, than coming from Northeast Philadelphia. And you said, so you, I, felt I, a bit, you, said you felt a bit like an outsider there. Um, how did you overcome that? Um, a, a lot of camaraderie, you know, uh, kind of getting outside of your comfort zone. And, and I would say I use that uh, every day today. Uh, how get comfortable so? with how being, you? you get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. How do you, how do you bring that lesson to work with you every day? Uh, every sales call, every opportunity to ask investors to invest in the company. Uh, those are uncomfortable conversations, you know, having the right employees do the right thing at the right time sometimes is uncomfortable. Frank? Andy, you mentioned that growing up sports were very important to you. I'm curious, what sports did you play and what was your favorite? I uh, played baseball and football, and football was definitely my favorite. What was your role on the football team? I was the, uh, the special teams captain and uh, the wedge buster on the kickoff team. All right, so the wedge buster, that's significant. What was your role as a wedge buster, and how does that relate to being successful today in business? Well, what you do as the wedge buster is you run down the field as fast as you can on the kickoff and you kind of slam into somebody who's usually a lot bigger than you and create a big pile up. So uh, it's a bit of a rush, but uh, you can't be afraid at any time or, or you're going to end up being at the bottom of the pile every time. Mm-hmm. Is, it, is that how you approach your business? Never be afraid. Do what you have to do. Absolutely. Shannon. Andy, can you tell us a little bit about your mom and what she was like when you were growing up? Sure. My mom was an elementary teacher uh, by trade. And uh, was constantly, you know, the one who was teaching us uh, kind of right and wrong. And, and uh, you know, my, my dad was the disciplinarian and we'd always run to mom, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day for, for support and uh, other lessons in life. And what was one of those lessons that she taught you that you carry with you into work today? Uh, it, it was, she has a saying that you catch more flies with honey than vinegar. Uh, so always really lead with, with niceness and kind of kill people with kindness and, uh, certainly try and do that on a day-to-day basis. Mm-hmm. Pat? Andy, what was your relationship with, like, uh, with your brother growing up? Uh, my brother's seven years and one day younger than me. He was actually born during my seventh birthday party. Uh, so that's always an interesting relationship. But I, I was more of um, kind of a caretaker for him with my parents both working. I had to walk my brother to school every day uh, and really take care of him. And what did you learn from that that helps you in your business today? Well, you learn uh, it, there's kind of a carrot and a stick philosophy. You know, it, it, it was uh, having kids that basically when you're uh, a 13, 14 year old, having a seven, eight year old to, to care for is a little unique. And, um, you know, you, you want to reward them for doing good things, but you also have to be a bit of a disciplinarian when mom and dad aren't around. Mr. Drummond. 
Andy, you told us a little bit about where you grew up in Northeast Philadelphia. Um, could you tell us a little bit about what, what you learned there, kind of hanging out with the neighborhood kids on the corner and, and kind of what you took away from that? Sure. Uh, it was always, you know, we jokingly, you know, if somebody was missing, we'd go knock up for them, uh, get them to come out of their house. Or usually if somebody was missing, there was, there was something that was a little bit off. So we would uh, always just make sure the whole group was there. And, and really the idea of um, kind of a pack mentality with, with the group of guys that, that I hung around with uh, it was one of the, the best memories of my life was uh, growing up that way. And how does that pack mentality carry over into your organization today? Well, you really are all, you're always looking out for your teammates, right? And it's not just in sports. That's always an easy analogy. I think hanging on the corner for me uh, built a lot more life lessons uh, than sports did. Mr. Bell? Uh, could you expound on your sibling relationship and how it has related to your business practices today? Sure. I, I, it was it was kind of, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, part teacher, part disciplinarian, um, having to engage with a, a younger brother who was a bit of a hothead and you know, kind of always getting in fistfights. I, I had to help to him to learn when it was right to fight and when it wasn't. And, um, you know, he's, we're, we're great friends to this day. Uh, he's actually an attorney now, so everything worked out for the best, but, um, I, you, you learn that everybody kind of needs that, um, that mentoring at times and, and certainly do that today, even with my co-founder here, uh, at Lone Star, we work together in a relationship that we're great friends. Sometimes I have to tell him he's doing a great job. Sometimes I have to tell him he might be able to do things differently and better. And and you know to be able to take that advice back too is important. Mm-hmm. Andy, got, mm-hmm. I got and Andy, you told us earlier that your dad was your idol. Why? Um, because he's the most uh, truthful, kind of sincere person that I've ever met. My dad was uh, was a Marine, as was my brother. Uh, my dad's originally from Germantown, uh, as I know one of the other guests is as well. And he's a, he's a tough guy, but uh, what you see is what you get. If you want the truth, uh, ask Phil Turner. He'll tell you. <laughs> And you said you sometimes run business ideas by him, right? How's that usually go? Um, you know, it's, it's funny. I, he's not much of a talker, uh, but to say it, it, Lone Star is a great example. I, when I told him about the idea for Lone Star, he said, man, that's a great idea. You should do that. And it was, uh, yeah, it, it's not, it, but he would have told me if he thought it was a bad idea too. So being able to have that sounding board all the time is uh, a truly invaluable. And, and it's funny. You just mentioned the Lone Star idea. You, you told me earlier that your your first job was a paper route, right? It was. And and you got a cart that allowed you to take the papers all over the neighborhood faster, right? Yep. I, I uh, kind of five finger discounted one from uh, the local actor. Yeah, but my point was, I want to I want to actually understand. It sounds to me like getting the cart to deliver the papers is a little bit like doing finance at point of sale, right? You're kind of finding shortcuts and creating an innovation there, right? So you've been doing that your whole life. Is that fair? I think that's fair. I always looking for the quickest way from point A to point B. Um, you know, that's the Lone Star. That's what we do is uh, push that finance opportunity out where the transaction happens. Wow. Who's got the next question? Yeah, Andy, these guys that you, you went to school with at LaSalle, are you still close with them today? I am. Uh, the, the best man in my wedding and uh, two other guys in my wedding were high school buddies. Uh, they're also investors in Lone Star. So we've kind of made the, the round trip there. It's kind of interesting that you were able to hang out on the streets in Northeast Philly, but also hang with some different kids at LaSalle. Um, that came kind of from a different area. How has like been able to kind of be a chameleon in situations impacted your leadership? I, I think it's the single uh, best benefit of going to that high school. Uh, you know, it, it, it taught me how to be uncomfortable, uh, but it also taught me kind of, you know, how to be an imposter and, and get by. You know, it, I wasn't from the same social situations as, uh, as my high school buddies, but learning how the other side lived, so to speak, has enabled me in business to kind of strike up similarities in, in communication with just about everybody we run across. And LaSalle is a Catholic high school. Do you, do you carry that faith into the office at all or? Uh, not at all, actually. It's uh, I, I jokingly, my wife and I would call ourselves recovering Catholics. So we, uh, I, I, Catholic school taught me a lot of lessons and I wouldn't change a thing about it, but uh, no, it's, we're not really a faith-based organization here at Lone Star. It's, uh, Andy, it sounds to me like you're a pretty humble kind of guy. You're not the kind of CEO to stand up and tell everybody, do it your way. You're all about B 
being part of the team, causing the team, making sure that you're knocking on everybody's door to make your teammates are okay and checking on them. Am I correct about that? I, I'd like to think so. Uh, that's that's one of the biggest values we have here at Lone Star is you know, sometimes you got to roll your sleeves up and do the dirty work. But at the end of the day, we're all on the same team. If, if I don't succeed unless my team succeeds. What, what's the website address for this organization known as Lone Star Technologies? It is exactly that, LoneStarTechnologies.com, but that's L-O-A-N, as you'd expect, as opposed to the, uh, the Lone, Lone Star, Star Technologies.com. We've been speaking with Andy Turner, CEO of Lone Star Technologies, here on Executive Leaders Radio. Don't forget to visit our website, ExecutiveLeadersRadio.com, to learn more about our executive leaders. We'll be back in a moment right after this quick break. You now can recognize your deserving business advisors on our nation's leading Business with Heart radio show, ExecutiveLeadersRadio.com. Yes, recognize, you can recognize your deserving business advisors on our nation's leading Business with Heart radio show, ExecutiveLeadersRadio.com. Simply visit ExecutiveLeadersRadio.com, securely enter their info, and we'll reach out to spotlight your deserving business advisors on our nation's leading Business with Heart radio show, ExecutiveLeadersRadio.com. Don't wait. This radio and online social media and search engine exposure is quite valuable to your advisors. Yes, this radio and online social media exposure is free and quite valuable to your business advisors who deserve to be recognized. Visit ExecutiveLeadersRadio.com now to nominate your deserving business advisors. We're back. You're listening to Executive Leaders Radio. This is your host, Herb Cohen. We'd like to introduce Ann Rice Burgess, President and CEO of Methodist Services. And what is Methodist Services? What are you guys doing? Methodist Services is a multifaceted human services organization that's been around for over 140 years. We serve over 2,800 people annually in housing, education, in-home services, and counseling. We're in West Philadelphia and as far as Bangor in East and above Allentown in Pennsylvania. And tell me a little bit about uh, where you're from, how many brothers and sisters, where are you in the pecking order? Mm -hmm. I grew up in Germantown. I'm the middle child of three. I'm the only adopted child in my family. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in a very diverse neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Okay. Frank? And if anybody meets you, it's obvious after 10 minutes that you and your organization are all about advocating for those that are vulnerable. I'm curious, how young were you when you first recognized the need for advocacy? Certainly. Well, I did a patchwork between public and private schools, and I really understood very early on that people have very different circumstances in life and that there is needs to be a connection between those who have the ability to give support and those who need support. How were you vulnerable? Well, as a biracial kid growing up in a community that – had all sorts of tensions between two different ethnic identities. I learned very early on that it is something that needs both mentoring, it needs a sense of community and connection, and it needs uh, a backbone to deal with some of the harder issues that a a person in my circumstances would face. Mm -hmm. Um, Matthew. Yeah, you, earlier you described Germantown where you grew up as a diverse neighborhood reflecting your family. What, what did you mean by that? Sure. So it was ethnically and racially diverse. There were high rise projects and half million dollar homes within blocks of each other. And we all lived together in community. And that meant both in a supportive way and also in conflict at times. And, and, and how does that reflect? How does that show in your family? Why is that a mirror your family as you described it? So in my family, I was the only person of color. And my dad taught me early on, he said, I just want you to know you're going to experience sometimes in life incidents where people are not going to understand you or like you because of what you represent. But I want you to know I've always got your back and I love you. And that lesson really prepared me for a lot of the harder things that came. And that's a lesson that uh, I think a lot of people could benefit mm-hmm. from. So, so do you bring that lesson to with you to work? Absolutely. How, how do you, you know, do that? There is, uh, there are people that are served by my organization that um, are coming from really hard circumstances, mm-hmm. 
And if there isn't a connection made between the people who are serving them, then there it then it's done in a way that um, comes with disdain, right? So my daughter attended the exact same child care center that we provide on my campus as people that we serve. And there was a woman there one time named Burgess, and her life was rough. But our two kids were the same age attending the same school. And I would address her every morning as, hey, cuz, how you doing? Because I knew that she and I wanted the same things for our children. And by seeing that, she could see a new trajectory for her life. Drew? Yeah, and you mentioned you went to a Quaker high school. What, what lessons were to be learned from attending a Quaker high school? Quakerism really teaches you about the intrinsic value of each and every person. And that is something that I carry into my organization. You know, um, I was born um, and placed for adoption at birth. It was a year later that my parents came to adopt and the agency told them in these words, and that's the language of the time, we only have retarded and mixed race children as if these are children who people would not want. So as a result of that experience, I believe today that regardless of the circumstances of your birth or the experiences having, that you have in life, you deserve the best. And that's what we do at my organization now. Ben? And what was it like growing up as an adopted child, specifically with siblings who, who weren't adopted? So I didn't look like anybody else. So it was always something that was um, present in my mind. But we were a close-knit family. But like all siblings, you know, you fight. And really, the way you grow up with siblings teaches you a lot about life. And there was one time when my brother said the meanest thing that he could say to me, which was, oh, you're adopted. And my response to that was, yeah, well, I was chosen. You were an accident. (laughs) Shannon. And in the green room, you mentioned you played a handful of sports growing up. Which one was your favorite? Certainly was lacrosse. I played that in high school. I played it in college and later had the opportunity to coach a high school team. I played the center position, which meant that I played both attack and defense. And then later, as I became a coach, I realized I really could see the whole field. I could identify talent and I knew how to place it. And that same skill set is something that I use as the leader of my organization now. Pat? And what was your first job growing up? I was 11 years old, and I got a job working in the nursery of the church where my father was the associate pastor. And I really got the job because I didn't want to go to church service. But what it really did for me is it taught me the value of working. I had to walk two miles to get there on a Sunday morning. I showed up every time. I worked every weekend, even though I only got paid twice a year. And what did that help you with um, that, that you brought to your to your job today? Well, you know, I think that uh, it's important, not just um, in my job, but also how I raised my daughter, is that there is a value to hard work and the work itself is of importance, not just what you get out of it. Only getting paid twice a year really <laughs> requires that you stay committed. It's not just about the money. It's about what you do. Jim? I'm sure you are aware that people will live up or down to the expectations that you show them. How do you use that in your job, in your own business today? Absolutely. What I don't believe is that people should set low standards for themselves. We provide housing for homeless people. And what we don't provide is housing that is adequate. We provide high quality housing because unless you've experienced that, then you don't know what you need to work towards. And if once you leave our housing program and you want to live in the same type of housing, then you know that you're going to need to advance your education and get work experience in order to do that. And so that is what we are trying to teach people. Mm -hmm. Next question. Who's got it? And you went to Quaker school and you sent your daughter now to a Quaker school. And we've all observed how self-reflective and aware you are. I'm curious what you would tell us about the value of silence. Oh, wow. That's great. You know, uh, Quaker school is really focused on um, teaching people the value of human life, but also critical thinking. And they also um, help you understand how to do that in silence, which is a form of meditation. I think that there is something of great value for everyone to take a moment to reflect internally 
before you produce what other people see. So, so how do you find silent, silence in that time to reflect in, a, in your busy day running this organization? Yeah, that's the tough part. You know, everybody needs a moment of self-care. Um, it's a little easier for me as an introvert to take those moments for ourselves. But I can say that one of the things that we do at my organization for staff who have what we call secondary trauma sometimes with the people that they work with, um, their circumstances leaking into the lives of the people that are working for us, is we we promote self-care and taking time. Mm-hmm. Shannon, did you have a question about the daughter or something like that? Yeah, Ian, you mentioned your daughter in the green room. I'm curious, what have you learned from her that you carry with you to work every day? <laughs> yeah, you know, one of the things that I learned from my own father was that you don't have to raise your child to be a mini you. I, there wasn't possible for me to be a mini of my father, but rather to really develop my daughter's independent identity so that when she goes forward in life, she's choosing a path that is right for her and not one that was defined by me. Mm. So it sounds sounds to me like what you're doing is you're looking at each individual in terms of the folks that are served by Methodist services, as well as your daughter in terms of who they are, as opposed to what you want to impose on them and trying to help everybody appreciate that they can get what they're looking for. In fact, you're trying to expose them to different opportunities as well. Am I correct about that? Absolutely. And I believe that everyone should do something outside of their comfort zone Mm -hmm. to stretch themselves. Mm -hmm. What's the website address for Methodist Services? Methodistservices.org. We've been speaking with Ann Rice Burgess, President and CEO of Methodist Services here on Executive Leaders Radio. Stick around. We'll be back in a moment right after this quick break. back. You're listening to Executive Leaders Radio. This is your host, Herb Cohen. We'd like to introduce Tim Bennett, owner of Bennett Compost. Tim, what is Bennett Com- Compost? What are you guys doing? We're making composting easy for the residents of Philadelphia. We do that by picking up every week from 5,000 households and 50 businesses their food scraps and making it into soil amendments and compost. Wow, that's a pretty innovative idea. Where are you from originally? How many brothers and sisters? Where are you in the pecking order? I was born and raised in Rochester, New York. I'm the oldest of two boys. Uh huh. And how young were you when you started inventing stuff or doing things differently or your own way? Well, I think when I was 14, I had a, I started selling candy bars to my friends and I would just take notes of what they liked and what they didn't and what sold and what didn't and then go back and get more of what sold and not buy the things that didn't sell. And, and that was the first time I started doing something like that. Uh-huh. So you're pretty aware of the market and what the demand is and filling needs. Drew. Yeah, Tim, you mentioned that community was important to your family and your mom and dad. How did they show that? They really showed that by kind of living their values every day and being who they wanted to be in the world and, and living out what they believed in. That that I didn't realize that when I was young, but stuck with me as I got older and more reflective. What do you think the key takeaway was from seeing that? I think the key takeaway for me was that if you want to see the world be a better place or change place, that you have some agency to do that. And you just need to go out there and, and work hard every day at it. So you think mom and dad are proud of what you're doing every day? I think so. I think so. I think the fact that the, their last name is on the business certainly helps. <laughs> Matthew? Yeah, Tim, you're, you're, you're taking food scraps and turning them into something. I have this image of your mother when you're a kid telling you not to leave any waste on the table. Was she doing that? Well, she didn't have to do that because I was eating all the food that was put out and then asking for more and eating my brother's food and eating any food that I could find. So that wasn't really an issue for her when it came to, came to getting rid of food. So, I was so very what, good at that from a young age. So what was it in your childhood that your parents did that gave you this sense of invention and this sense of wanting wanting to take food scraps and turn them into something useful? Well, they were more about, I think, whether it was food scraps or, or that, but more about just if you believe something or if you see that the world should be a way, go forth and make it happen. So they weren't pushing their own values, but just by demonstrating the way they lived their lives, I think I picked up a lot. Mm-hmm. Frank? Tim, I get the impression that you're you're not afraid to do anything, including getting your hands dirty. Where's that work ethic and mindset come from? Yeah, I think uh, it's come from 
kind of as a child being very into sports, but not being very good at sports. So having to really do everything it, it took to, to be on the team and, and make things happen and go forward. And, and yeah, I am dealing with garbage every day. So it's certainly not afraid of a little, little dirt. So why is it do whatever it takes mentality important in running your business today? Well, I think for two reasons, one is it is a dirty business. And so if you're going to be squeamish about doing the things that have to be done to get, get what you have to get done, you're not going to succeed. I think also the fact I started the business with a hundred dollars and an idea of what could happen. And if you weren't willing to do everything without big investment dollars behind you or a lot of money, you weren't going to make it happen. So you just had to get down and dirty and and get after it. Mm -hmm. When you were growing up in Rochester, uh, you mentioned the neighborhood was transitioning and so were the kids in school. What are you talking about? Yeah, I think that when I was growing up, there was a lot of kind of, ethnic and racial changes that were happening where I would be from very kind of a mixed, very mixed neighborhood to being one of the few white kids in, in uh, my classes in my school as I got, I got older. And um, I think it gave me a lot of perspective into people who were not like me and, and the challenges that they faced and made me feel grateful for what I had and, and helped me to realize that like, I didn't have an excuse not to work hard if these other people who came from more trying circumstances than me were working hard, then I should, I should get after it too. Shannon? Tim, in the green room, you mentioned that basketball was the sport you were the worst at, yet it was your favorite. And that really stuck out to me. I'm curious, why didn't you shy away from it and focus on something else? I think I like a challenge. I like to think I don't do well. I want to get after them. And and so the fact that I wasn't a good natural basketball player and the fact that my brother was, who was younger than me, made me really want to prove myself and and work hard and double down to, to show I belonged. And liking a challenge and being tenacious, how does that relate to the way you're building your team today? Yeah, I think a lot of the people who work here, they who work for us, they work very hard and they get after. And some of them have come from some pretty troublesome backgrounds and have made some mistakes in their lives, but they're not afraid to work hard and not afraid to do the things they need to do now. And I think those kind of people are the kind of people who really succeed as opposed to people who think that uh, this is just going to be easy or glamorous or, or something of that nature. Mm-hmm. Pat? Tim, you touched on a couple times that um, you have to kind of make your own way and you, you can't can't wait on someone to invest in your business. Where did that that sense of um, entrepreneurship and, and just go do it come from? Honestly, I, I think I really just like to not wait around and do things my own way is a big part of it, um, especially early on. As I've gotten older, I've realized the value of building a team and getting help and having other people contribute. But especially early on, it was if you, I want to do something, I should just go out and do it and not let anything or anyone else get in my way. Is there any way that you relate that back to the neighborhood that you're from? Yeah, I think I, there were a lot of uh, kids I grew up with who didn't have any choice but to figure out a way to make their own way. And so that seeing them do that and seeing that their drive and their hard work really kind of left, I think, a pretty profound impact on me. And, and again, not able to make any excuses for myself. If other people are doing it, why, why can't I? Ben? Tim, you're the uh, oldest of two. You have a younger brother. Could you tell us a little bit about what that sibling relationship was like outside of uh, taking his food? Yeah, I mean, me and my brother are, are, are best friends now, but growing up, we we fought a lot and we competed a lot. And I think I resented sometimes that it felt like he was naturally better at, at sports than I was. And so I had to put him as my younger brother in his place. And I'm glad that uh, he was able to forgive that as we got older and 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 be my you know my best friend these days. And that fighting and that, that competitive nature that kind of bred this tenacity, how does that carry into, you know, your decision to take the leap into founding this company and running the organization to that? Yeah, I think it's it's just one of a number of experiences that have shown me that if you want to do something, like you got to get after it and figure out a way and kick and scratch and claw and, and, and just make it happen. Mm-hmm. Jim? The... Um thing that puzzles me is why compost? (laughs) Well, composting was something that I started to learn about and I really wanted to do because I saw the environmental benefits of removing food waste from landfills and I didn't have a good way to do it. And I was living in a South uh, Philly apartment at the time on the second floor and I couldn't figure out a way to do it myself. So I thought there might be a business here and there might be other people like me who want to do this. So I went after and started finding those people and signed them up for the service and kind of grew the business, grew, 
this like that with a hundred dollars I put in a bank account and just a, a will to, to go out and make it happen. So how large or how small is this opportunity of helping people with um, compost? Well, I think it's, it's incredibly growing uh, food scraps and other organics uh, make up 30% of the waste stream. And it is, we know how to remove that and make it into a beneficial use but we're just not doing that any kind of large scale now. So there's just a lot of opportunity to handle this food waste in a better way and to turn it into something beneficial that will, again, also help us to reduce our use of chemical fertilizers. So you're an entrepreneur. You're doing this just because of the money, aren't you? No. I mean, any business owner is certainly going to want to their business be successful and want it to uh, make money. But there's also, you know, I always wanted to start a business, but I wanted to start a business that had a purpose more than just making money. And so initially the additional purpose here was the environmental mission of finding a better way to handle the food waste and doing my part to address climate change and reducing my impact and other people's impact like me. And additionally, there's grown, I think there's a, there's a social aspect in terms of providing good paying jobs to people who are working, willing to work hard, but may not have come from a traditional background with a traditional education and uh, this opportunity allows them to kind of grow and become leaders among of themselves and see opportunities and, and go forward in, in the world. Huh. So you're really interested in building the community, it sounds like. Am I mistaken about that? I think we all have our part to play. And, and I certainly want to play my part to make my community and my city and, and the people around me into a better place. And, you know, I can't change the world by myself, but I can change my portion. And if everyone has that attitude, then the world will be, will continue to, to get better and be a better place for everybody. And that's, that's really driving you earlier in the green room. You mentioned that you think your mom and dad, you know, you really, you would, this really would make them proud. Give, give me that thing again. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I hope that that would be the honor. I think of my life to, to know that my work that I was doing made my parents proud, which I think it does. Perfect. The website address. BennettCompost.com. We've been speaking with Tim Bennett, owner of Bennett Compost, here on Executive Leaders Radio. Don't forget to visit our website, executiveleadersradio.com. We'll be back in a moment right after this quick break. Recognize your deserving business advisors on our nation's leading business with heart radio show, Executive Leaders Radio. Yes, recognize, you can recognize your deserving business advisors on our nation's leading business with heart radio show, executiveleadersradio.com. Simply visit executiveleadersradio.com, securely enter their info, and we'll reach out to spotlight your deserving business advisors on our nation's leading business with heart radio show, executiveleadersradio.com. Don't wait. This radio and online social media and search engine exposure is quite valuable. Yes, this radio and online social media and search engine exposure is quite valuable. To your business advisors who deserve to be recognized, visit executiveleadersradio.com now to nominate your deserving business advisors for free exposure. Back. You're listening to Executive Leaders Radio. This is your host, Herb Cohen. We'd like to introduce Rob Craven, Jr., president of F.A. Davis Company. Rob, what is F.A. Davis? F.A. Davis is a college textbook publisher that specializes in the health sciences. Uh, we are 142 years old, and we are independent and closely held and family run. I am part of the family. And how many brothers and sisters? Where are you in the pecking order? And where would you come from? I'm the oldest of three, and I am from suburban Philadelphia. All righty. And 8 to 14, what kind of stuff were you up to? What were you doing as a kid? I mean, I was really into sports. I, mean, I couldn't wait for my dad to take me to the next game. I looked for friends that had the passion as uh, rich as, as mine was. I The Phillies, the Eagles, I knew all the players. I took okay. index cards. Drew, didn't you have some questions about that? Yeah, Rob, it sounded like you spent a lot of time with your father growing up at these games. And I'm just curious, what's the what's the lesson, the main lesson that your father taught you? Well, being with my father the way I was, I could see uh, what the charisma that he had could do to attract others, to gain respect, um, to 
um, to be with him was uh, to actually um, to call him my idol, and he was. And 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 those lessons you learned, kind of about charisma, and de- you know, kind of developing deep relationships, is that something you still leverage today at, at your work? Well, I hope to. You know, I feel like I can never be what he had become. You know, and I feel like if I'm a fraction of that, then mm-hmm. um, then I'm doing pretty good. Mm-hmm. And so he set the bar high, and I've been trying to catch mm-hmm. it ever since. Matthew, yeah, Rob, how many generations of your family have run this business? We've got three generations. And and I think we've all heard this morning your pride in the fact that it's a family business and how much and how much that means to you. But when I actually asked you about that pride, you you told me something about some employee awards. What was that thing that you told me? For any employee that's been with F.A. Davis for 20 years, they get a silver box engraved, you know, with the logo on it. And then they are uh, presented that in front of the whole group. Uh, They get roasted. And I have had, I've done that 51 times because of the pandemic. The 52nd is waiting for her silver box. Mm-hmm. But that is my pride and joy. Frank? Rob, in your business, you need to produce information that's timely, accurate, and relevant all the time. How do you absorb that? Do you, do you work many roles in the business to, to get to that point? Well, I think uh, when I started, uh, I was in sales. And I was in sales because my father said, uh, your Aunt Reen never let me go into the uh, sales because she was wary of the ways of salesmen. Uh, but you're going to be a salesman and you're going to call on the schools. And so I did. And I learned what it took to be competitive. I learned the, what the customers demanded um, in terms of timing, in terms of what content they had in their textbook, what technology came along with that. So and, as president, as president and CEO, go. how do you get 140 team members to think and act the same way? Uh, you give them, you trust them for what they are. Uh, I think I saw that with my father. I saw the way he handed down the trust, uh, giving people autonomy, give them a chance to fall down and get up, see how they react to adversity, and then coach them from there. Mm -hmm. Shannon? Rob, in the green room, you mentioned that Aunt Reen was always someone you looked up to. Um, What did you learn from her that you carry with you into work nowadays? Uh her perseverance to keep dependent to keep the business independent for 43 years is remarkable and she went through three receiverships she went through the depression she took over the business before women's suffrage and she was belittled uh, by many of the men you know that tried to cross her and you knowing that and seeing that how does it affect the way you're building your team today Well, I think, um, well, especially for the women in the business and the portrait that's in the uh, the, our green room, uh, they look up to Aunt Reen as as if she's their idol and and what she did coming through. But sixty percent of our business uh, represented by women. Pat, and you you mentioned in the green room that you didn't really get along with your brother growing up, um, largely due to how competitive you were. What did that what did that teach you? What kind of lesson that you bring with you to work today? Well, it taught me that you you are allowed to have a regret, um, and you can convert that regret into something positive. Uh, my brother did join the business and spent twelve years helping us um, conform to the information revolution. He knew the graphic arts better than anybody, so I became dependent upon him. And so there I was, having beaten them down through our childhood, and uh, and it saved our relationship. And so what I learned is, uh, please uh, give me a second chance if I have a regret, um, and I try to do, impart that to all my employees. Ben, how does that impact uh, employee conflicts at your at your company today? Employee conflict, um, I think. We keep an an open and communicative atmosphere. Uh, We do engagement surveys uh, that have been most helpful. Ironically, during the pandemic, the engagement survey rating turned out to be higher than it was when we were together. Cool. Ben? (laughs) 
Uh, Rob, you told us in the green room you have a distinct memory uh, from the age of six going to, to Christmas parties and, and social gatherings with the company. What, what did you learn from that experience that you carry with you today? Well, uh, I think um, the, 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 co- the collegiality that took place around Christmas time and the affection that all the employees afforded my brother and my sister and me when, when I was six, um, I think. We had a feeling of family unity that extended beyond our home address. We felt just as home, felt like we were just as much home when we were on Cherry Street, the address of F.A. Davis. Mm-hmm. But how does that carry over today in the, in the organization? Well, I think, um, I think the longevity and uh, the fact that we have many young employees that are looking for a reason to commit to F.A. Davis. You know, is Rob going to sell? No, Rob's not going to sell. Rob wants to keep it, the company as independent as Aunt Reen did. And, and I've had to profess uh, that ethic all along. Mm-hmm. Jim? How effective have you been in selling the wholesome nature of being family-owned and operated? Well, I think, um, fortunately, uh, we're the only ones. <laughs> and so uh, most of our upper management and, and many of our skill positions um, all come from the other side where the grass is not quite as green. And they, they see it that way, and we cultivate it that way. And um, I think well, we call it publishing at the grassroots level, and uh, that's what we profess. Mm-hmm. If, if we had a lot of time, what are we missing that you'd like to help our, our audience understand and you'd like to communicate? Well, I think um, the special nature of F.A. Davis uh, surviving the merger and acquisition uh, trend that took place in the 80s and the 90s and the fact that we um, actually have become reliant upon all of these big corporations as almost a farm system for, for really high end talent, you know, the best editors in the business, I think are working for us, but they all started with the other side. And so I think being independent and being family run and being able to profess those values is, uh, is really um, a game changer in terms of people feeling committed and feeling loyal and feeling the trust that I hope to be able to impart and live up to the charisma that my father, uh, Barr, had uh, set for me. Mm -hmm. How do you think your uh, your aunt would feel nowadays if she uh, if she knew what you were doing with this business? I, I, I think about that a lot. (laughs) I, 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 I would like more than anything to sit down with her and share with her what we're doing and have her respond. And I how do you, think how do you as think, proud as I am. How do you think she would respond? What do you think she'd tell you? I think she would ask me whether my kids are going to get in the business. <laughs> <laughs> What's the website address of this organization known as F.A. Davis Company? What's your website address? Uh, at the F.A. Davis dot com. F.A. Davis dot com. We've been speaking with Rob Craven, Jr., president of F.A. Davis. And uh, Matthew, could you give us a rundown on who we've had on the air today, please? Yeah, it's been a really fun show this morning, Herb. We started off with Andy Turner, the CEO of Lone Star Technologies. Then we had Ann Rice Burgess, the president and CEO of Methodist Services. Following that, we had Tim Bennett, the owner of Bennett Compost. And just now we wrapped it up with Rob Craven, Jr., the president of F.A. Davis Company. Thank you. I'd like to thank my co-hosts with their wonderful intuitive instincts, including Shannon Lane, Newmark Knight Frank, Drew Hanlon Hanlon, Pat Riley, USI, Frank Hennessy, Premier Planning, Ben Drummond, D2 Integrated Solutions, Matthew Shapiro, Obermeyer, and Jim Bell, Able HR, for giving me a hand structuring the questions, hoping providing our listening audience an educational and an entertaining show like to thank our listening audience for listening. Otherwise, we wouldn't have a radio show. Don't forget to visit our website. It's executiveleadersradio.com to learn more about our executive leaders. Thank you for joining us today and have a nice day. Bye-bye.